Hello there, and welcome to Made in London, episode two. Uh, the, our, our tour about Londoners who have invented things and created things and pioneered things. Uh, the tour is free, but if you can donate to Macmillan Cancer Care, we'd really like that. And we've got some London themed souvenirs that you can make yourself in the creative spirit at virtuallylondon.com. Uh, so, my name's Rebecca. Um, I've been a tour guide since 2006 and a virtual tour guide since 2021. Uh, the chap on my left here. Hello, my name's Gordon. I've been a tour guide also since, ooh, certainly 2000, I think mm -hmm. so. Uh, and uh, yeah, a virtual guide for the same length. Of yeah, time. exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, so Made in London, we, we decided to do what we'd never have been able to do as in real life tour guides, um, which is go along a tube line um, with this particular tour, um, picking a, a couple of creative Londoners at each tube stop. So we picked this section from St James's Park to Tower Hill. If you saw episode one, we did a section of the Victoria line with fewer stops, so we had kind of a theme for each stop. But this one we've chosen a lot more tube stops so we've just picked a couple of random people that might occur to these two particular tour guides as we were going through that tube stop on the train maybe on the way home or something so it's a bit random um, theme there's no real theme uh, tonight we're starting out at St James's Park uh, underground station and actually with the building that the tube station is in uh, this is uh, 55 Broadway the building is called you can see the tube station just in the uh, ground floor there on the Google Street View there it is a bit further away uh, 55 Broadway is until recently you can see it's flying the flag there until recently it was the headquarters of transport for London although they moved out a few a couple of years ago uh, and 55 Broadway was the first official skyscraper in London. This is slightly confusing actually uh, because it, it all depends on the definition of skyscraper. Uh, so it was built in the late 1920s um, and so the definition of the skyscraper it has to be steel framed. Tick in the box there and um, there's 55 Broadway under construction. Um, so it is steel framed but it wasn't the first steel framed building in London. That was the Ritz Hotel like 10 years earlier. And the building has to be above a certain height um, 55 Broadway certainly got it for the 1920s anyway it was above that height it wouldn't qualify now but in the 19 early 1920 late 1920s it was above that height in fact it was so tall that for the first year or so it was up they couldn't use the top floors because the fire brigade's ladders didn't go up to the top floors um, and in the 1920s the definition included it had to have an elevator which 55 Broadway did but again it wasn't the first in London first elevator in London um, there have been several lifts or elevators or ascending rooms, as they were known in London at the beginning. But crucially, 55 Broadway was the first to have all of those things. So it was first to reach the right height, first to have a steel frame, first to have a lift uh, altogether. So it was known as the first skyscraper in London. Uh, in a weird kind of quirk of fate, 55 Broadway is the first building to be considered a skyscraper in London. The first building to be considered a skyscraper in New York City is also on a street called Broadway. So it's weird. I don't think they planned it like that. Uh, as a complete aside, the the exter whoops, sorry, um, the exterior of the building has some amazing sculptures uh, on it by 1920s artists, uh, including Jacob Epstein. That was one of Jacob Epstein's that I put up too soon. Uh, his sculptures are called Day and Night. Uh, Londoners at the time in the late 1920s were shocked and horrified by the nudity. Um, so they were going to actually remove them until Epstein agreed to make the male figure a little bit less manly, if you catch my drift. Now moving on back to St James's Park uh, and Stafford Place there, just a short walk from the underground station. Stafford Place, there it is on Google Street View, and there you can see uh, on the building a blue plaque for Lord Hoare Belisha. Uh, Lord Hall Belisha, if you've visited London before, uh, the name Belisha might be ringing a faint bell. There's Lord Hall Belisha. He was Minister for Transport in the 1930s. Uh, it, this was at a time when vehicles were becoming more common, more people were owning cars. Uh, cars looked like that. That's a car show in uh, uh, Paris, uh, in Versailles, in Paris, in the early 1930s. 
Uh, so more people are owning cars, there's more cars on the road, and bizarrely, the UK government in 1930 abolished all speed limits. There had been speed limits, but they abolished all of them. Uh, this won't be a surprise to you that the road accidents and particularly involving pedestrians rocketed uh, in the years after that. Uh, just a, a few months after Lord Horbelisha had been made Minister of Transport, he was nearly hit by a speeding car in North London. And whether that was what made him decide to do it or not, we don't know, but he was determined to make life safer for pedestrians on London's roads and UK roads. So he reintroduced speeding limits, he introduced things like the um, driving test and the highway code, uh, and he introduced pedestrian crossings that were safe where pedestrians took priority. Black and white stripes on the road and orange beacons at either end. We call them zebra crossings and we call the beacons Felicia beacons. Um, uh, the first one was actually in West London in, uh, in 1934. I don't have a photo of that. Here's a Belisha beacon in front of Westminster Abbey. Uh, there's a very gangly teenage me cuddling the Belisha beacon at Abbey Road, which is probably the most famous ever crossing in the world. Um, so Lord Hall Belisha invented these uh, uh, road crossings, or he created these pedestrian road crossings. And th the deaths dropped, probably because of the, well, people often uh, quote the highway code, as being the reason a uh, uh, pedestrian accident, road traffic accidents dropped, um, but it might be something to do with speed limits and safe pedestrian crossings as well. Um, uh, some drivers were very angry because they thought these speed limits were infringing upon their freedom, um, but for most other road users, probably pedestrians particularly, Lord Horbelisha was a hero. They even named a card game after him, the safety first card game. I think he would have liked that. Uh, right. On we go, on to our next tube station, uh, on to our next tube stop, which is Westminster. There it is, Westminster. Uh, we're not going far away from the tube station this time, this is one of yours. Okay. Um, the building is where, where we come to is come out of Westminster station and it's right next door. It's a building with a green plaque, not a blue plaque, a green plaque. We're sticking with road safety with the world's first traffic lights. Um, on the 9th of December 1868, the traffic lights were designed by railway engineer John Pete Knight and were installed at this corner of Parliament Square to make it easier for pedestrians to cross the road but also to ease the traffic flow on Westminster Bridge. Don't forget until this point cars had had it all too good, you know, which, anarchy really. So on the 9th of December 1868, night's traffic lights were installed. They had semaphore arms inspired by railway signals and gas lit red and green lights for use at night. The signals had to be operated by a policeman and they were successful at easing traffic flow but sadly less than a month after they were installed on the 2nd of January 1869, uh, there, there was a gas leak and the traffic lights exploded, <sighs> injuring the unfortunate policeman on duty. The idea of traffic lights caught on in America. They created the first electric or aut automatic traffic lights. Apparently it took Londoners a little while to get over the exploding traffic light <laughs> incident. And the next set of traffic lights weren't installed until 1926 uh, near Piccadilly Circus. It made you a bit nervous, wouldn't it? Exploding traffic lights. Yes. For our next world first, we're staying near Westminster Tube Station and we're just going slightly further away, slightly up Whitehall, um, to, well, to what remains of Whitehall Palace. And so Whitehall, the road is named after Whitehall Palace, once covered the whole area. Um, in the photo here, we've got Banqueting House, which is the only bit of it to survive. Yes. But we've got there a map of Whitehall Palace. There's Banqueting House in the middle and a, a painting of it, both from the 17th century, just before it was destroyed by an accidental fire in 1698. Mm. Quite a significant palace. It was very popular with monarchs and popular with this chap. That's King Henry VIII. Yeah. Uh, Whitehall Palace is, this, this seems vaguely unbelievable sometimes when you tell people for the first time, it's where Henry VIII had the first stair lift installed, you know, like a thing that goes up and down the stairs. 
Um, in the inventory of Whitehall Palace, it's referred to as the chair that goeth up and down. Um, and it was installed on a 20 foot staircase in Whitehall Palace. Um, it, it, we don't know exactly the kind of engineering behind it, but it seems likely that it was a, a kind of block and tackle affair and involved a lot of servants uh, to get them up the stairs. It's, it's easy for us to be uh, a bit dismissive and say that this notoriously overweight king, it was his weight that meant he needed a stair lift, but it was actually um, that he, he did have a, a trouble moving, he had mobility problems. Um, he was a, a keen sportsman, there he is jousting to show off in front of Catherine of Aragon. Uh, in uh, 1936, uh, 1936, in 1536, uh, uh, in a jousting accident, uh, he, he damaged his leg uh, so badly that it never really healed properly. Uh, and it was after that that he needed the stair lift at Whitehall Palace. And of course, when he gained weight, that made his mobility problems even worse. So he needed it even more. Um, there, there's also some evidence that there was a mobile version of a hoist to help him up if he fell uh, and couldn't, had trouble getting up. Uh, and it, again, there's a, some evidence that he was assisted by this mobile hoist when he was inspecting the Mary Rose. Um, so the Tudors also seem to have invented the mobile, mobile hoist as well as the chairlift. But again, probably only worked if you were the king and you had a lot of servants and everyone around you was afraid of getting their heads dropped off, chopped off if they dropped you. Um, so yes, the very first stair lift in the 16th century uh, on Whitehall. Mm -hmm. uh, now, our, our next first is at Westminster Abbey. There's been a lot of inventive and innovative people buried in the Abbey, and we could spend all day there talking about them, but instead we'll go a little bit off topic. And here's a painting of Westminster Abbey as it was being prepared for the coronation of King Edward VII and Queen Alexandria in 1902. That's Queen Victoria's son and wife. Um, there's a lot of bright blue carpet to make sure it is pristine for this big occasion. Forward Hubert Cecil Booth. Booth had been an American, Booth had seen, excuse me, an American inventor demonstrating a cleaning device that blew dust and thought it would be much better if the device had sucked in the dust. Um, he made his version of this cleaner and coined the phrase vacuum cleaner. He was asked to clean the carpets with his brand new invention and arrived at the ancient abbey in his horse-drawn vehicle, which he called Puffing Billy. Okay, so there's Puffing Billy. As you can see, it wasn't exactly portable. <laughs> the device was parked outside the building and the horses, uh, the hoses, excuse me, would be snaked inside. You can't really tell in the black and white photo, but apparently Booth's vacuum cleaner was bright red. Westminster Abbey became the first public building to be vacuum cleaned. So there you go. Booth's business caught on with the king himself ordering his own puffing billy and society ladies hiring him out and inviting their friends over so they could all take tea and watch the device removing dust from their house Charm. from their houses houses you know. <laughs> an american inventor uh, beat booth to the patent um to the vacuum cleaner but booth is still usually credited as the inventor of the first powered vacuum cleaner good old london yeah. we lead the world in vacuum cleaners <laughs> Um, on to our next stop, which is Embankment. There it is. Uh, embankment, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> That's about it. Embankment, there it is on Google Street View. My apologies. We're actually saying inside the tube station. There we go. There's a platform at Embankment on the description circle. We don't even have to get off the tube for this one. Um, we're talking about the very first recorded public safety announcement, the very first regular public safety announcements, uh, as recently as 1968. 
Um, it, it, up until the 1960s, the London Underground announcers, uh, announcements, safety announcements, were being made by the drivers or platform staff. But by the 1960s, there were significantly more people travelling by train, more regular trains, and it just wasn't feasible. So they decided to record them uh, so they would automatically play uh, at certain times. Um, the first recordings were actually by a sound engineer uh, in a studio in Bayswater. Um, uh, he recorded them because they'd hired an actor, but the actor had refused to speak a word unless he could be assured he was getting paid the royalties. So London Underground kind of said, yeah, we're not doing that. We might play your tune thousands of times a day. We're not paying you royalties. And he stomped out, the actor stomped out. So the sound engineer on duty that day kind of went, oh, well, I'll do it. And the sound engineer recorded the immortal lines, mind the gap and stand clear of the doors, please. And they were played on the tube uh, for years. Uh, well, for a couple of years. The, the voice that I most remember uh, as a child, and I think uh, uh, perhaps a lot of Londoners my age, and he was only phased out in, in some stations very recently, is Oswald Lawrence. Um, Oswald Lawrence, who I found mildly terrifying as a little girl. Um, I, I'm not sure I can do mimic him, uh, but if you're an older Londoner, you may remember, mind the gap. Uh, he, he was a little scary. Um, if you'd like to relive my childhood nightmares, Oswald Lawrence is still played at Embankment Station, um, which was a bit of a shock to me when I stepped off the tube one day. Um, uh, so yes, it, it's usually female. Most of the, the um, London Underground lands now use female voice artists and uh, London Underground drivers and platform staff uh, refer to the women as Sonia because she gets on your nerves. I'm sure she does when you've heard the words mind the gap every six minutes. Um, just an aside for Londoners, by the way, if you've been sat on a tube train and you've, it's kind of slightly annoyed you that all the Americans are giggling every time the announcer says mind the gap at every stop, uh, and you think, God, what's so funny? Um, it's probably because Americans don't actually use the word mind in that context. Um, for, for Americans, it just, it just refers to the brain, the mind. They don't use it like the English do for watch out. So that probably seems like a really weird sentence to Americans, which is why you always hear Americans going, oh my God, mind the gap, oh my God. Um, so don't get annoyed at them, just uh, two countries separated by a common language, it's not our fault. Um, right, back to Embankment, for a, a Londoner who should get more credit than he deserves, uh, really. His, his uh, memorial is just around the corner from Embankment Station, um, it's Joseph Bazalgette. Joseph Bazalgette, the, the inscription on his memorial there says he chained the Thames in Latin. Uh, and Bazalgette saved the Thames and perhaps even saved London. Uh, in the 1860s, the Thames was quite bad. Um, the, the, in 1811, London had been the first city in the world to reach a population of one million. And that coupled with the Industrial Revolution had just made, uh, and bearing in mind that all the waste in London at this point is all going into the River Thames, made the Thames disgusting. In 1858, the Great Stink occurred. Sounds like I'm making it up, but it's a genuine historic event. The smell from the river got so disgusting that you couldn't go anywhere near it. Um, they had to evacuate buildings near the Thames. If they couldn't evacuate, they had to soak the curtains in bleach so you couldn't smell the river. Um, Benjamin Disraeli, one of our prime ministers, said that the uh, the... The Thames was a Stygian pool reeking with ineffable uh, and indescribable horrors. Uh, so they had to do something and Joseph Bazalgette came to do something. Uh, he was commissioned to create London's first comprehensive underground sewerage system. Uh, he created the sewerage system. He actually invented a new way of making bricks um, that wouldn't degrade in the moisture and, you know, stuff in the sewers. Um, uh, the, the, he made fired 318 million bricks, probably not personally, uh, and created 1,100 miles of sewers throughout London. The project was finished in 1866, uh, at which point London, uh, London became the first city to reach 2 million population. Bazalgette had actually realised that the, the London's population was going to continue to grow like that, uh, and he made his sewers much, much bigger than he needed to, uh, and they were still doing this okay, really, uh, into the 20th century, well into the 20th century. Um, I love that. I, th th that all was really just an excuse to use this image, because I think this is a great cutaway. You've got Embankment Station there with the little steam underground train. 
Charing Cross with the steam trains, the boats on the Thames there, Bazalgette's sewer. It's good, isn't it? Anyway, sorry. That's me being a bit nerdy. So back to Embankment, I'm sorry. Uh, we're behind Embankment Underground Station for our next one. There we are. That's OK. Sorry. Yeah. Bazalgette's super sewer, of course, made a, a great deal of impact uh, by defeating the deplorable, what the Victorians referred to as the miasma uh, that, that, that uh, drifted up from the water, stigging depths of, of the river. Anyway, <laughs> let's continue. Here in Villiers Street is where we are. And on the wall, you can see a blue plaque for Rudyard Kipling. He was living here when he first moved to London from his birthplace in India. Uh, and he was living above a sausage and mash shop called the Sausage King. Um, as part of his rent, the Sausage King included as much sausage and mash as he could carry upstairs on one plate, which, which was a good, good deal, but yeah, challenging, I imagine. It said that while he was living there, he always wore a fez while he wrote and had a note in the door that said to publishers, a classic while you wait. Modesty as well. <laughs> uh, he's probably most well known for his children's books, Just So Stories, but mostly The Jungle Book, of course. He also wrote the first Christmas message for King George V in 1932. Hmm. He was the youngest recipient for the Nobel Prize for Literature. Hmm. Um, Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> he created, or yeah, he lost his own son during World War One, and he was one of those who pushed for war memorials to stop glorifying war and instead remember those who had died. Mm. He brought a lot of words and slang into the English language, including squiggly, bagsy. Pucker, Blub, Deco, and Cushy, uh, which all have meanings which I think are generally well known. Bagsy as in claiming ownership, uh, Pucker meaning good, Blub as in cry, and Deco as in look at, Cushy, which is London slang for comfortable. Um, anyone who watches Only Fools and Horses will hear all that stuff. <laughs> Uh, uh, the slang. We're starting at a temple stage. No, 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 oh, hang on, you've missed a few Sorry, words. excuse Kidling me, I'm words. jumping ahead of myself. Jammy, which is slang for lucky, uh, Grinch, and cover for the children's eyes for these next two, um, sex appeal, and the phrase, the world's oldest profession. Uh, oh, we've got a couple more authors later on who also created words. But the first we're on to our next tube station, which is Temple. Yes. I'll do this bit, I'll do this bit. Um, so yes, Temple. Temple. Uh, and again, we're not even leaving the underground station. Uh, we're staying at the underground station here. Um, so this is Temple Underground Station, uh, the exterior of it, in, in, uh, on uh, Google Street View today. And there it is in the 1890s, um, as it would have been known by our next creative Londoner, which is Emma Ortzi, um, spelled O-R-C-Z-Y. If you've seen her name on books, there's a giveaway. Uh, Emma Ortzi was Hungarian born. Um, she'd moved here as a teenager with her family. Uh, and in the late 1800s, early 1900s, 1890s, 1900s, uh, she and her husband were struggling a bit for money. So they were just kind of taking jobs wherever they could as translators and illustrators. Uh, Emma Altsy was writing some short stories. She, she actually introduced one of the first female detectives, uh, Lady Molly of Scotland Yard. Uh, and one day she was standing on the platform at, at Temple Underground Station. That's it today, but it was very similar apart from the modern signage in uh, 1903. Emma Altsy was standing on the platform uh, and came up with the idea for a story uh, about a wealthy foppish aristocrat called Sir Pace, Percy Blakeney uh, who also happened to be a dashing hero, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Uh, she, it became very popular in her day, in her lifetime, 
uh, and she is credited with creating the genre of a masked figure with a secret identity, a la Batman and Spider-Man and, and, and I can't think of any others, Banana Man. Um, so yes, next time you're waiting for a train and you're getting bored, try and think of a classic like Emma Ortsey, that might be a bit of an ask. Uh, just next to Temple Underground Stations, we're not going far away, is Somerset House. Uh, Somerset House is uh, uh, there. We go on Street View. Uh, Somerset House. There it is on Street View. This arch here is where boats would have gone in to deliver cargo. Uh, Somerset House. There used to be a palace on the site, actually a royal palace. And um, there it is. You can see the, the Tudor portion of it there. Um, Beautiful Riverside Terrace where Canaletto sat in the 1770s to paint this beautiful scene, uh, Riverside scene. And not long after Canaletto sat on that Riverside Terrace in the 1770s, uh, Somerset House was torn down. The old palace was torn down and the government announced that they were using the old palace, they were rebuilding the building and it was going to be used for offices. And there's Somerset House. And um, you can see it's arched there before um, Battle Jets Embankment got in the way. Um, Somerset House was the first purpose-built office block uh, in the 18th century. Um, the offices were used for various things. A lot of the Navy offices, including Nelson's office, um, was at Somerset House. Uh, the Registry of Births, Deaths and Marriages was there. Um, the Stamp Office, the Inland Revenue, um, the Royal Society, the Royal Academy. Many more. Yeah, pardon me. Uh, it's known today less as an office and more as an exhibition space and art venue. Um, and it's also actually the, this unchanged 18th century courtyard is glorious and it's often used for filming locations. Uh, here it is dressed for a Sherlock Holmes film, but you often see it. Uh, uh, don't go to a movie with a London tour guide because they'll just be constantly pointing out Somerset House. Um, uh, oh, you had something you wanted, you were going to add to this, weren't you? you wanted to add to this. Uh, well, St Catherine's House was also where the old TV music show, Ready, Steady, Go, was filmed, um, which was popular in the 60s. It's by no means the first TV music show, but it's where the phrase, the weekend starts here, comes from. Uh, the show was filmed on a Tuesday, but it was aired on a Friday, and during a recording, a group of mods was asked by the presenter what their plans for the coming weekend were. The remarks replied, are you kidding me? The weekend starts here. And that was it. Ready Steady Go did see a few firsts. It's where Jimi Hendrix appeared on television for the first time performing Hey Joe. The Beach Boys had the first British TV appearance on Ready Steady Go. And it's where the Supremes performed the dance moves for Stop in the Name of Love for the first time. And don't pretend you're not doing those moves. Um, but the, the reason we moved to St Catherine's House was that's where the Registry of Births, Deaths and Marriages moved to after Somerset, after it moved from Somerset House. Yes. Sorry. I didn't do that because you said it already. Oh, did I? Oh, yeah. sorry. So that's why I didn't do it. <laughs> Our next station is Blackfriars. I can't give you an exact location for this next London creator, but he lived and had his workshop somewhere along the River Fleet, which ran along the street Blackfriars Tube Station is on today. Here's the Google Street View image, as if we've just stepped out of Blackfriars Station, is an artist's impression of how it would have looked in the 16th century, when Peter Street had his workshop and yard there, right by the river. Peter Street was born in 1553 in the parish of St. Stephen's Coleman Street in the city of London. He became a carpenter and when a fellow parishioner at St. Stephen's, James Burbage, was building London's first theatre, he hired Peter Street to help build it. As you can see from the legend, this image shows the Globe Theatre. Peter Street went on to be the go-to guy for building theatres in London. Um, Street built the Globe Theatre, recycling the timbers from the theatre in Shoreditch and storing them at his woodyard in Blackfriars. Mm. 
Street was also hired to build the Fortune Theatre in the City of London, so um, assisted with the first permanent banqueting house at Whitehall Palace and built an indoor theatre here in Blackfriars. None of Street's buildings survived, sadly, but the modern recreation of the globe is a good indication of what Street's theatre would have looked like. I sometimes wondered whether Peter Street was the inspiration for Peter Quince, hmm. the carpenter and rude mechanical in the midnight, Midsummer Night's Dream. It's likely that Shakespeare would have known him. Yeah. Probably. Um, back to Blackfriars, actually quite near here um, is Fleet Street, so we've got to get a few publishing firsts in. Uh, on that corner, just off Fleet Street, is St Bride's Church. There it is, lovely church. Uh, St Bride's Church is where this chap, Winkin de Ward, set up the first printing press uh, on Fleet Street in 1500. Um, Fleet Street, all his printing chum, chums joined him and Fleet Street became the heart of the printing industry and the newspaper industry until the late 20th century. Uh, Winkin de Ward had actually been the assistant of William Caxton. William Caxton had fought... Uh, Put me to think. William Caxton had bought uh, the very first printing press to England uh, in the 1470s and Winkin de Ward had come with him as his assistant. Um, they'd both been training in, in um, Belgium and it's thought that because of that uh, that the, they introduced the H, the silent H, in English words like ghost and ghoulish and gherkin. Um, so that it's thought that that is where that silent H comes from, from the sort of Flemish language that they would have learned in. Um, yes, so Winkin de Ward uh, set up his printing press on Fleet Street. The first person to have the, the printing press on, on Fleet Street, he had inherited Caxton's press. Uh, Winkin de Ward's most well-known, most bestseller, um, not most well-known, but his bestseller was a Latin grammar book, which I'm sure was thrilling. Um, but his bestsellers were things that Caxton had printed first and he was still printing 30 or 40 years later. Um, Robin Hood stories, uh, Winkin de Ward was still printing, The Canterbury Tales he was still printing, uh, and Le Mort de Arthur, um, the King Arthur story he was still printing as well, after Caxton had printed it. Uh, in fact, back to our map there, uh, Le Mort de Arthur was written by Thomas Mallory uh, when he was in Newgate Prison, which is uh, uh, just there, in the 1460s, during the, during the Wars of the Roses, he was in prison there and whiled away his hours writing Le Mort d'Arthur, which is the source of the King Arthur legends. Um, some say that Le Mort d'Arthur is the first novel in English, the first English novel um, published in 1471. Um, uh, sorry, he di Mallory died in 1471, it was published a few years later. Some people do disagree with that though, because they say that Mallory's Le Mort d'Arthur was more Middle English, than English um, and some also say that it was it, because it was a translation and Mallory never hid that he was translating it from a French um, book and um, because it's a translation it doesn't count because it's not an original story. Oh the arguments about what is the first book in English um, uh, could take hours to explain. Just one more printing first uh, just on Ludgate Hill there uh, is where the Daily Current was first printed in 1702 um, and printed and owned by a woman Elizabeth Mallet. Uh, who said that she, she was only going to print the news, she wasn't going to put any editorials or any opinions because uh, she thought her readers had wit enough to work it out for themselves. Um, uh, she, she, she actually went out of business quite quickly, but nevertheless it was the first daily newspaper in the world in 1702. Right, back to Blackfriars. Also near here is something that Londoners aren't particularly proud of, but it's a thing. Um, near Blackfriars station was, I'm afraid, the first coal-fired power plant. Uh, at Hoban Viaduct, the first in the world, um, so I'm afraid yeah we started it. Um, but we also lead the way in some renewable energy sources as well. Just next to Blackfriars tube station is Blackfriars railway station, there it is. Um, so it's a Victorian railway bridge um, that was converted to be a railway station and completed in 2012. And when they finished it, um, it was kind of unveiled uh, as the world's first solar bridge and the world's longest solar bridge, which it still is. Um, I, there is, there is, actually, there was actually already a footbridge in Australia that was a solar bridge that had solar panels along it. Um, but for some reason, bridge nerds never count footbridges. I don't really know why. 
So this is the first solar railway bridge anyway. Um, the, the solar panels are, there's 4,400 solar panels there uh, and they provide about half of the railway station's electricity, which is enough to make 80,000 cups of tea a day uh, and saves about five, 511 tonnes of carbon per year. Um, so it's surely good, good old solar bridge. It's still the largest bridge in the world. I, I think there are a couple that have followed it um, since then. I think there's about three around the world now. It only opened in 2012, though. give people time. It's a fantastic bridge. The, the, the platforms are actually on the bridge there, so you get great views. This is a, a photo I took while waiting for a bridge, uh, uh, while waiting for a train late at night, um, on one winter's evening. Gorgeous thing. And not the first bridge to generate power. In the 16th century, uh, a, a water wheel was installed on London Bridge to pump water up to the city of London and to provide power for um, mills um, and things like that. Oh yeah, on we go on to Mansion House, uh, just opposite Mansion House or almost opposite Mansion House tube station is Bread Street. There we go. We've got two writers for the price of one on Bread Street. You've got the first one. John Milton. John Milton, the poet, was born on Bread Street in 1608. He narrowly escaped execution after the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 for his support of Oliver Cromwell during the Republic. His best known work, of course, is Paradise Lost, which he wrote in 1667 after having lost his eyesight and dictated the work to his daughters. He seems to have divided opinion with some, including William Blake and Wordsworth, thinking him brilliant. Philip Pullman based his dark materials on a line in Paradise Lost. But other writers, including T.S. Eliot and John Keats, don't like his style at all. So it divides a lot of opinion there. Milton introduced a lot of words into the English language, including fragrance, stunning, terrific, although Milton used it in the sense of terrifying. Um, he was the first to use space in the context of outer space. The phrase by hook or by crook is one of Milton's, although it's sometimes attributed to Cromwell. Uh, words like unoriginal, earth-shaking, enjoyable, padlock, lovelorn, pandemonium, debauchery and many more. John Milton contributed the greatest number of words to the English language than any other author. Over 600 words are attributed to Milton. That's more than Shakespeare, Ben Jonson and Chaucer. Yeah. Um, our second author on Bread Street, back to Bread Street again, is uh, uh, John Don. There he is. Uh, John Don was born on Bread Street in 1571. Uh, he was a, a poet and he was a traveller. He actually travelled with Sir Walter Raleigh at one point. Um, uh, he became a priest quite late in life. He was about 50 uh, years old when, at the urging of King James I, he became a priest and was appointed Dean of St Paul's Cathedral. He did still keep writing poetry after he became a priest, but he leaned more towards kind of metaphysical poetry. And religious poetry after he was a priest rather than love poetry and sort of satire is what he was doing before. Um, he was Dean of St Paul's, became Dean of St Paul's in 1421 uh, in, and he, there we go, his monument was the only thing from St Paul's Cathedral floor that survived the Great Fire uh, in 1666. Uh, he, he became Dean of St Paul's in 1621, sorry, did I just say 1421? I meant 1621. Uh, it, the, the statue here fell through the um, cathedral floor and survived the Great Fire of 1666. Uh, John Donne is another one who invented words. Uh, he, he has contributed about 300 words to the English language, uh, including valediction and self-preservation. Um, but he's a lot more well known, I would say anyway, um, for his the phrases that he's introduced to the English language, um, uh, such as death be not proud, any man's death diminishes me, for whom the bell tolls, and No Man is an Island uh, are all John Don quotes. John Don quotes. Yeah. Sorry. 
No. Uh, a short walk from Mansion House uh, tube station, there is a site that was nicknamed London's Pompeii. Uh, this is the modern building on the site, known as the Bloomberg Building. Um, on the site during World War II, a second century Roman temple was discovered in a bomb crater. Uh, it was excavated to the delight of Londoners who queued for half a mile to see the remains of this ancient temple identified as being to Mithras, a Persian deity popular with Roman soldiers. Uh, it was preserved and further excavation was carried out in 2016 when the modern building was being constructed. And here are some of the finds discovered on the site in 2016 and 1954. During the recent excavation, they discovered the remains of wax tablets. And here's a modern replica of the ancient writing implement. Of the 400 tablets discovered, 87 were still legible. The, this one is the first recorded use of the word London from shortly after the Roman invasion in AD 43. They also discovered the first uh, century version of a souvenir pencil, a stylus with an inscription on it along the lines of, I went to Rome and all I got you was this lousy pen. If you're ever in London, the Roman temple and some of the finds are on display in the basement of the modern building. Yeah, it's grand, it's great. Um, still on Cannon Street. A short walk from Cannon Street, there we go, is St. Stephen Walbrook Church. There it is. Uh, St. Stephen Warbrook Church was designed, uh, was rebuilt by Christopher Wren after the Great Fire of London in 1666. Uh, it's, it's actually often said that the, this dome here was Christopher Wren's dry run for the big, much bigger dome at St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, St. Stephen Warbrook is ridiculously beautiful uh, inside. No little church in the City of London has any business being that beautiful. And it's got this very unusual layout with the, the, the round modern stone altar in the middle and the, the circular chairs going around the outside. Um, the modern stone altar was actually designed by Henry Moore, sometimes nicknamed the Melting Camembert. Uh, and the rector at the time, who had the, all of this installed, had to fight criticism and controversy uh, and get special rules um, laid up by the Church of England to ha have this layout approved. Which he did. The rector's name was Chad Vara. There he is. Uh, Chad Vara, who is much more well known, he's pictured here with a telephone, because um, he's more well known for setting up the Samaritans, uh, a helpline um, for those who are depressed. Uh, this, he, he, he was inspired because he'd uh, officiated at a funeral of a teenage girl who had sadly committed suicide because uh, she thought she'd got an STD, when in fact it was just a, her, her first period. Uh, he was very saddened by this, as anybody would be. Uh, and he thought if only there had been a number she could have rung uh, where it would have been in confidence and she could have talked to somebody, maybe things would have worked out differently. Um, so he set up this helpline in the basement in the crypt of the church in 1953. Uh, and it's, it's still going to this day. Uh, on a slightly bizarre note, Chad Vara was also one of the co-founders of the comic The Eagle, featuring Dan Dare. He even wrote some of the some stories for it uh, in his spare time. So a Renaissance man, certainly. And just behind Cannon Street, uh, well, kind of towards the river um, from Cannon Street Tube Station, uh, is this site here along the River Thames. Uh, we're going to talk about Dick Whittington. There he is. Uh, Dick Whittington was uh, sort of three and a half times Lord Mayor of London uh, in the turn of the 14th, 15th centuries. Uh, he gave much to London. He, he uh, in fact, we're living in interesting times just now. It's really unusual for a Lord Mayor to have to, to serve more than one term. Dick Whittington did four, sort of three and a half, really. Uh, the, the, so Dick Whittington, that's the 15th century, early 15th century. Uh, the next Lord Mayor to serve two consecutive terms is our current Lord Mayor in William Russell, because they couldn't hold an election because of COVID. 
So interesting times indeed. Anyway, uh, Dick Whittington gave an enormous amount to London. So in his uh, will, he left a, a huge amount of money to London's disadvantaged poor um, to build almshouses, to build, uh, to build hospitals, schools, libraries. Uh, and here uh, on the banks of the Thames, Whittington's Longhouse, which was a toilet. It was a public toilet in 14, uh, opened in 1421. Uh, Whittington's Longhouse uh, was not the first public toilet uh, in, in London, even in London. There had been privies usually jutting out over the Thames. Um, Whittington's Longhouse was very much on the Roman models. Here's a Roman toilet. Uh, it was a communal toilet. There were 64 seats for men and 64 seats for women. Uh, and it was thought to be the at the time anyway, London has referred to it as the largest in Europe. It was the largest public toilets uh, in Europe. It was fl uh, and the most hygienic as well. It was flushed by the Thames. It was kind of over the Thames and this system had it flushed out by the Thames. Uh, so it was the, the, it was so famous, so big and so famous that Longhouse actually became slang for toilet. Uh, in London. That slang has passed out of use a bit, um, but uh, kind of up until the early 20th century, I think if you'd said Longhouse to a Londoner, they would have known what you meant. And um, this, this implement um, was discovered nearby uh, and dated to the time that Whittington's Longhouse was quite new. Um, the British Museum delicately call it a toilet implement. It's um, a medieval toilet roll. Let's just use our imaginations. We're going off to the monument. Our next tube stop along is Monument. Uh, and we're going to talk about, uh, there it is, Monument. The building, the structure that inspired the name of the tube station. Uh, it's called simply The Monument. It's the Memorial to the Great Fire of London. Uh, designed by Sir Christopher Wren and Robert Hooke, although contemporary writers generally credit Robert Hooke alone. So I'm going to talk about him because I think he's cool. Uh, so Robert Hooke was a 17th century scientist. He worked at the Royal Society. He was actually, the other members of the Royal Society would pay him to investigate their own theories or um, demonstrate experiments. So he was at, Robert Hooke was actually the first paid research scientist. Um, it, like many learned men after the great fire of 1666, he turned to architecture um, to help rebuild the city of London and the monument was one of his commissions. Um, Robert Hooke decided he was going to build a science laboratory underneath it. Um, so his science laboratory was underneath the base. And at the time, Robert Hooke was, he was trying to prove the heliocentric model of the universe, that the Earth goes around the sun. And the way to do that, um, he instinctively knew, was to kind of track stars, have a fixed point and track stars um, uh, around it. And this was the idea that the monument was going to be that fixed point. So he could stand in his um, uh, laboratory underneath the base, look up through the stairwell, through the golden bowl of fire at the top and up to the stars. Uh, sadly for poor old Hook, that didn't go quite to plan. Um, he, he in, in the 17th century, he discovered how traffic can interfere with scientific instruments. The, the traffic going on and off London Bridge, it was all, you know, cart stones and all this sort of thing going on and off London Bridge. Uh, and he, couldn't do it. He had to abandon his laboratory. Although he did use uh, the monument for conducting experiments into the chair, how air pressure changes with height. He designed each of the monument's steps to be six inches tall, which is actually very uncomfortable height for a step, and he knew that, um, but it was so he could gradate his experiments on air pressure. Um, he used it to, um, with a long pendulum to investigate the rotation of the earth. Uh, Hook was, was a kind of a renaissance man, really, although he's hardly known at all, not like his contemporaries like Wren and Newton. Um, he, he, the one thing he is known for is microscopes. So he, he created a book called Micrographia, uh, which had incredibly detailed um, images of things he'd seen under his microscope. He was the first person to use the word cell in relation to a plant cell, which you saw here. Uh, he discovered bacteria and protozoa, although he referred to them as little animals. Uh, he created a, the chemical uh, equation for combustion. Uh, he came up with a proof of gravity at the same time as Newton. Uh, in fact, he always said he'd done it first and Newton had copied him. Uh, and uh, yeah, he, he seems to have been rather a Renaissance man, I think, anyway. Uh, just next to the monument is London Bridge. The, oh, sorry, this is one of yours. Sorry. Go That's on. right. Sorry. Next to the monument tube station is a London Bridge 
Um, this is the modern London Bridge built in the late 20th century, but it stands on the site of the first bridge across the Thames, built by the Romans in the first century. It is thought that the reason the Romans established London where they did is because they could easily ford the river here. Um, and there is some 2000 year old timber in the porch of the church Magnus the Martyr, which is right next to the modern bridge. Traditionally, uh, this is thought to be timber from the first London bridge. There's probably more than one wooden bridge. It's likely it was destroyed quite a few times. The first one was probably destroyed by Boudicca's revolt in AD 60. She burnt London to the ground so thoroughly that archaeologists still find a layer of burnt soil hmm. in the underground at that level, at that time. A London bridge was also pulled down in 1014 by King Olaf of Norway to defend the city of London against King Forkbeard of Denmark. Uh, the English king at the time was King Ethelred the Unready. Saxon and Viking uh, leaders had great names. It's thought the nursery rhyme, London Bridge is falling down, is inspired by this incident. There are other references to the wooden bridges being either repaired or replaced until London has got sick of the bridge falling down constantly. So a stone bridge was built by Peter Colchurch in the late 12th century. Colchurch's bridge ended up having houses and shops and even a church on it. And it lasted for 600 years. Harking back to uh, road safety first earlier on, the first traffic policemen in the world were employed on London Bridge in the 18th century to prevent traffic jams. And here they are doing an excellent job. London Bridge was also the first place where it was made law to drive on the left. Old London Bridge, as it's known, was replaced in the 19th century with New London Bridge, which was then sold to an American businessman, and subject to many legends here, <laughs> and replaced by London Bridge in the 20th century. Yes, along we go. One more, our last tube station uh, is Tower Hill. Um, and we're going to go for the big obvious thing, which is the Tower of London, uh, which is London's only castle. It's, it's pretty much there's, there's the tube station. It's the first thing you see as you come out of Tower Hill tube station. It was London's first castle, uh, um, not London's first castle, sorry, it's London's only car only surviving castle. We've got a, a few stories, actually there's a lot of firsts we could talk about at the Tower of London, so we've just kind of picked a few favourites. We, we, we've spoken about this in previous videos, but the Tower of London was home to the first public zoo or menagerie, as it was known then. Royals and other wealthy people across the world have been collecting animals in private menageries for centuries before the first lions arrived at the Tower of London in 1210. It wasn't even the first animal collection in England. William the Conqueror had kept his lions and camels at Woodstock in Oxfordshire. Um, the first elephants since ancient times arrived in the country in the 13th century uh, this drawing was made at the time by Matthew Paris. People flocked from miles around to see it walk from coast from the coast uh, to its new home at the Tower of London, perhaps to see if the medieval belief was true that elephants had no knees. The first polar bear also arrived in the 13th century, a gift from the King of Norway. The polar bear was housed in the moat of the Tower of London and allowed out into the Thames on a long chain where curious Londoners gathered to watch it fish. Londoners would also have been able to hear the lions roaring. So Londoners got a glimpse of the animals, but most Londoners 
weren't able to visit the menagerie of the tower, not at first anyway. To get inside the tower and see the animals up close, you had to be either a visiting dignitary, nobility, or in prison, as was the case uh, with other menageries around the world. It was Queen Elizabeth I who made the tower the first royal menagerie which was open to the public. Londoners had to pay to enter unless they had a dog or a cat that could be fed to the lions and then it was free entry. Oh, yes, there's a legend that when Queen Elizabeth I made a speech at the Tower of London just before her coronation, she recalled her time as a prisoner at the Tower and thanked God that she'd been delivered like Daniel from the lion's den and right on cue all the lions at the Tower of London started to roar. Mm. The Tower's menagerie remained public until it closed in the 1830s and the animals were moved to Regent's Park to London Zoological Gardens uh, or where we get the word zoo from. Yes. there. Um, the next one is my nerdiness, really. Um, this is a map-making nerdy thing. Uh, sorry. Uh, the Tower of London is where the, this, the, the United Kingdom was first mapped inch by inch uh, in, in, by the Ordnance Survey. It's where the Ordnance Survey offices were. Um, so the Ordnance Survey was actually um, born out of a fear of invasion. In the 1790s, um, it was feared that France were going to invade any second. Um, so an inch by inch, really, really accurate map of the South Coast was commissioned so that they could accurately place defences. They needed to know where all the landscape bits were. So that was done at the Tower of London. That's why it was based at the Tower of London, because it was a military endeavour um, at first. The threat of invasion passed and they, they thought, well, how are we going to get money out of this? Oh, I know, we'll sell them. So these maps of Kent at first were sold. This is one of the first Ordnance Survey maps that was sold in 1801. And at the time, the Ordnance Survey Department thought, oh, it'll take 50 years to map the entire country, bearing in mind they have to go, they have to go to every inch of the UK and measure it inch by inch. Um, it, it took about seventy years in the end. The the probably the most well known director of the Ordnance Survey was Thomas Colby. Um, Thomas Colby uh, was with him from the early days in the early eighteen hundreds. Uh, he'd actually lost a hand in a shooting accident, but he still uh, uh, went out on surveying missions. Even when he was the boss, he went out on surveying missions. He seems to have liked uh, surveying mountains and, and, well, Ireland. He did a lot of surveying work there as well. Um, but he would, he liked going up to the top of mountains. And when they got to the top and they'd finished their survey, uh, he would always celebrate with a huge mountain top party, which all, always featured a giant plum pudding, which I'm not clear on how they got that up the mountain, but still. Um, uh, so yes, the Ordnance Survey uh, w was the first kind of comprehensive map uh, of the UK. Uh, it, it, it was uh, another map, though, is Jonas Moore. Um, so this is Jonas Moore. Uh, so we're going back a couple of hundred years to the uh, 17th century. Jonas Moore was the first man to chart the Thames from Westminster to the sea. Um, he was a mathematician. He was actually working at the Tower of London with the observatory. Um, so he was doing mathematical uh, calculations for the first observatory at the Tower of London. Um, and he also helped to build, he did a lot of the mathematical equations to get the Royal Observatory in Greenwich right as well. So he's not really known for his maths, uh, but he is known for charting the Thames. Uh, his, his map does still exist, it's with the Royal Collection, but it's unavailable at the moment, um, which probably means it's, it's loaned out. It's, it must be in an ex exhibition somewhere. But I do have a little sketch that Jonas Moore did uh, when he was doing his survey. Uh, Jonas Moore also, th this isn't a first or anything, but he also, his, his uh, treatment for his own sciatica was to boil his buttocks, um, which history does not record whether that worked, so I'm not going to recommend it. I, I think probably not that. And our last story is a romance. At the Tower of London, the first Valentine's Day card was written by Charles, the Duke of Orleans. He was a French noble who had been captured at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. He spent the next 25 years in castles around Britain, including the Tower of London. Like many young royals at the time, he had married his wife, Bonaventure, 
when they were both very young. He was 15 and she was 11. Uh, but for an arranged marriage, they do seem to have developed feelings for one another. When he was at the Tower of London, he wrote to his wife on the 14th of February, referring to her as his Valentine. Geoffrey Chaucer had already associated Valentine's Day with romance, but this was the first Valentine's letter. Charles wrote many poetry books in both English and French, and in one of them is this great illustration of his imprisonment at the Tower of London. You can even see the old London Bridge mm. in the background. That's great, yeah, that's St Paul's Cathedral in the background there as well. Um, yes, ending on a, a fantastic old kind of vintage picture uh, of, of uh, a centuries old picture uh, of London. Um, uh, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed our slightly esoteric and random jaunt uh, up the district and circle line. Uh, normally we would we would do in real life tours, we would do a, a, a crass tip speech at this point and our virtual tip jar is down there at paypal.me. Um, but we'd much prefer it if you donated to a charity. Uh, our chosen charity for this talk is Macmillan Cancer Care. Um, uh, and there's our Just Giving page, but you could donate through, the, uh, uh, through them as well. Uh, thank you very much and we'll see you next time for Tales of Paranormal London, episode three. We're going to West London this time. Thank you.